But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. All right, so here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is laying out what communion is. And what I'd like to do today is talk about the who, what, when, where, and how of communion, all right? Or of the Lord's Supper. It's the same title here. You're in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's look at verse number 19. I want to point this out to you. Verse number 19, he says, For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So he's writing to the church at Corinth and says, you know what, you guys are messed up. There's heresies among you, and you know, that is life. There's going to be heresies among you. There's going to be false prophets among the real prophets. That's always the way it is. I mean, you look at the church that Jesus had. Of his 12, you had Judas, who was a devil, right? He had a devil from the beginning. He was working for Satan. He was working for the reprobate Pharisees. And so it was just, it was to make manifest those that are approved. So that's why you'll have a distinction in communion. Uh, you know, and today there's a lot of heresies in communion. Look at the next, well, actually jump ahead to verse 23. I want you to see this. He says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So he's saying here, hey, what I, am, what I have received is what Jesus gave. What we are doing, what we are teaching is the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did with his church. He's just continuing it. He's confirming it. And you know, he says, hey, there's going to be heresies. There's this warning here. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 12 and really keep your, keep your place in 1 Corinthians 11 and Exodus 12. We will be there quite a bit today for this sermon. And so there is a warning, because listen, today there is, there is a Catholic conspiracy to corrupt communion. That what they do is not biblical, and yet it seems to have some of the symbology, it seems to have some of the similarities. So there's a warning here that there are heresies of the Lord's Supper, and God wants us to understand the distinction between the things. And we need uh, to use the Bible as a litmus test. It's only the Bible that can cut through the, the misunderstandings. So Paul was setting these things in order. He's trying to tell them, hey, you need to follow Christ's example, because the way they were doing it was wrong. They were doing it in the wrong manner, in the wrong spirit. And so Paul had to correct them and set it in order, right? Uh, Jesus, you know, he said that he must keep the Passover. So he was really continuing that Passover. But as we know that he was the Passover, the Lord Jesus Christ was our Passover lamb. And so we don't eat lamb when it's time to do the Lord's Supper, or the Lord's table. You know, we continue what came after that, which was the days of unleavened bread. Now, the leaven was a picture of sin. So what we do is, hey, we get the sin out of our life. We break bread. We remember what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. And, you know, meanwhile, there are many heresies out there. The Catholics have hijacked Christianity. The Catholics are fake Christians. And most of your pre-Vatican II Christians would even say, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic. They would make a, dis you know, that distinction. Whereas today with this ecumenical movement, hey, everybody's a Christian, you know? We are universally Christian and there is no hell. Everybody gets to go to heaven. And listen, those things are not true. Those things are a lie. And what the Catholic Church does with all their, 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 their attire, just the garb, the vestments, the Bible clearly warns us about the pagan vestments. I mean, they dress up as, you know, basically what the Roman judge or the Roman cops look like way back in the day. And that's where they get their garb. And they pretend like they are something or somebody. They're prestigious and they have authority. But guess what? They have no authority. According to the scriptures, they're not even children of God. In fact, most of the people that work for the Catholic Church are children of the devil. They are deceivers. And what they do that they call communion, you know, they, they, they even take another name. We call it, uh, you know, the, the sacrament of the Eucharist, right? And then they take what is the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, and they take pieces of it and they pervert it and they present it in a different way. You know, they call it a mass. A mass you know, the word has a, a, a few origins, but it all goes back to the same thing. It's talking about, uh, you know, like a dismissal when somebody died. A mass is actually a death ritual. And listen, when they go, th when the Catholics go through 
this uh, conspiratorial communion, if you will, because they conspired to pervert the scriptures. They came together in secret. They said, we're going to establish our pagan government. We're just going to call it Christian, right? So when they hijacked Christianity, they conspired against Christ. They conspired against communion. They said, we'll take all the symbology. We'll bring it in. We'll do a death ritual and we'll kill Jesus again every time. Every time we do the communion, they are literally killing Christ yet again, as if his sacrifice was not enough. So there's a lot of misunderstandings about communion. Most of it, it actually stems from the Catholics, or even the Orthodox Church, or even the Protestants, those that broke away from the Catholics, just to protest the Catholic Church, to try to reform it. So your Protestants, your Reformers, your Catholics, you know, most of those, they are not even Christians. They are trusting in their own works to get to heaven. They, their doctrine comes from men and not from God. And so, of course, they have perverted baptism. We all know that. And we're not going to get into that too much today. But they've also perverted communion. They perverted the Lord's Supper, and I want to help cut through some of that and uh, make it clear from the Bible, the who, what, the when, the where, and the how of communion, of the Lord's Supper. So we're going to ask those five basic questions and give you the answer from the Bible. And, you know, you know, there are even Baptists today that are messed up on communion. So it's not just Catholics, it's not just Presbyterians, it's not just Orthodox. There's a lot of people that don't understand it. So I hope, I pray that through this sermon I can answer whatever questions you may have. So the first question is, who? Who should participate in the Lord's Supper? Well, the answer is simple. It's every Christian. Right? It's every Christian. And, you know, the Bible uses this phrase, unworthy, we just read. And we're going to deal with that. We're going to talk about who is worthy and, and unworthy. Uh, but, you know, first of all, com communion is not closed. There are many Baptist churches today, they say, well, you have to be uh, accepted as a member. You have to be in good standing, which means you have to have uh, visited church at least once in the past three weeks. Well, where do they get that from? They get it from the Catholics. They get it from the Catholics. So we do not have a closed communion. It is open. Well, what does that mean? Come on in, sit down, have communion. Now, we talk about it in advance because there are requirements to do it properly. So we want to warn you, we want to tell you, uh, you know, so it's not just members that are in good standing. Uh, you're in Exodus chapter 12. I want to I show you this throughout the Old and the New Testament. So you're in Exodus chapter 12. Find verse number 47. Verse number 47. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land. No uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Now, now hold on just a second here. So first he says, all the congregation shall keep it. Now we know according to the Bible, the word congregation and church are interchangeable. The word church simply means congregation. It is the assembly. So he's saying, first of all, all the congregation shall keep it. But then he makes a distinction and he says that you should be circumcised. Now for those that don't know, circumcision was a picture of salvation, right? They were commanded to keep the covenant of circumcision after they heard the testament, after they believed the covenant, if they believed it, they received it. Hey, in the Old Testament, they got saved. And so that was a picture of salvation. Now, keeping your finger there, of course, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it, it says that you should rather circumcise your heart. What does it mean? It says, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Hey, do you want eternal life? Love the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept the gospel, right? So circumcise your heart, right? Circling your heart. Hey, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You set to your seal that God is true, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So believing the gospel is circumcising your heart. So in the Old Testament, he said, hey, everybody has to keep it. But if there's a stranger here that's not circumcised, they're not allowed to keep it. Right? So it actually had provision that if there was a stranger that came in, you could present them who God was, why we have this covenant, what circumcision was. They could believe it, receive it, get circumcised, and also participate. So who keeps the Lord's Supper? It should be every Christian, every believer. Right? You're back in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Find verse number 27. 
Verse number 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So, well, unworthily, what does that mean? What is he talking about here? Is there somebody in here that is not worthy? Like, well, you're less of a Christian. You're a babe in Christ. You haven't been here long enough. Or you're not a member yet. We all have to agree on you. Listen, that's how the world would interpret it. That's how the Catholics would interpret it. But that's not how the Bible interprets it. Look at the next verse, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So, who is unworthy? It's the man that doesn't examine himself, right? It's the saved person should keep it, but if you're not examining yourself, if you're not willing to look into your heart and find the problems and get them out, he's saying, then you're unworthy. You need to get that right first, right? Because this is a time of the year to purge yourself of sin. Look at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body, right? Not recognizing, not discerning means to, to be able to see, to discern between things, to recognize, to have wisdom and insight. Hey, you don't know the Lord's body. You don't understand what you've been forgiven of. So why are you holding on to that instead of participating in the Lord's Supper? Not discerning the Lord's body. So as a Christian, it's that time of the year for you to just find what's wrong and clean house. Hey, spring cleaning. We do it physically, we do it in houses, ought we not to do it in our heart? Ought we not to just do it in our lives as Christians, yearly, for the sake of the Lord? Look what he says in verse 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Right, so the goal here is to get sin out of our lives. So we don't get sick, so we don't sleep. When he says sleep, he means dead. Hey, there is a sin unto death. That's in the Old Testament, we call it a presumptuous sin. The man that refused to hear the correction from the Lord, that didn't want to hear what God had to say, God said, okay, I have a judgment for you. I'm taking you home. I'm bringing you home early. I'm going to give you something wrong to where it might, you might get, get your attention. Look at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should be should not be condemned with the world. Holding your place there, go back to Exodus chapter 12. Could somebody hand me my water on that desk back there? <clears throat> when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. He says, hey, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, right? So if we would take that time to get the sin out of our life, and we do that every single year and we just plan on it, then we don't have to worry about it sneaking up on us three or four years later. Right? Then we don't have to be judged of the Lord and chastened of the Lord because we take care of business every year. So who else is unworthy? I would say every unsaved Catholic is unworthy yep. to take communion. Every unsaved Mormon, every unsaved Baptist, Presbyterian, fill in the blank, anybody that's not a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, beware, be warned. All right, now look, Jesus had open communion. He let an unsaved man take communion. He had Judas right there with him taking the Lord's Supper, so he didn't restrict him. He knew the truth. He allowed it. Now, it cost him his life, but look, you know, I want you, I want to read, you're in Exodus chapter 12. Stay there for a second. I want to read to you what the Catholics say when they keep the Eucharist sacrament. The priest first will hold up a cup, and they call the host. They have a wafer. It's not unleavened bread all the time. It's a wafer, and they call it the real presence of Jesus, right? The, that is the Holy Ghost, they'll even call it. And, you know, they try to, you know, I, we talked about the solar monstrance. It is a sun, a golden sun as an idol that they will put the host in, and they'll adore it, and they'll say, this is God. And their point, they're worshiping the sun. The Bible warns in Exodus about worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, and other gods. Well, that's all the Catholics are about, are worshiping devils. They worship other gods, and they want to trick the world into thinking that they're finding the real God. You know, they want to trick the world into thinking that the Catholic priests, they can become saints and they achieve perfection, but you lowly people never can. You just need to keep coming closer to us and following us. And they make it very difficult to understand what they're doing. And they use very mystical, pagan symbology throughout the entire process. So the priest will hold up the host, you know, which is the bread, and the cup. And the priest says, 
This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, think of it. They're holding up a wafer and they say, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They're holding it. All right, and it may not be leaven. It can be leaven or unleavened. They don't care. It doesn't matter to them. But they do use alcoholic wine. They will hold up fermented, corrupted wine and say, This is God. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They say, these things take away sins. And they go through a process. And they, you want to take your sins away? Come down to me and you can receive that forgiveness by taking these things. They say, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to His supper. And then the congregation responds, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you. But only say the word and I shall be healed. Now, this is a perversion of what was said in Matthew chapter 8 about saying, you know, saying, Lord, I'm, not, I'm unworthy to receive you in my house. Only say the word and, and thy servant shall be healed, you know. So, I mean, there's, they actually pervert scriptures and they mash these scriptures together to come up with this. So, it sounds godly. It sounds like it comes out of the Bible, but they're perverting things. But notice, everyone that takes this Eucharist, this Catholic communion, they say, I am not worthy to receive you. That's right. Hey, I say amen. They're not worthy because they're not saved. They don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, so they are not worthy of His supper, of His table. And it's very wicked what they're doing because they're perverting what Christ did, what He said, hey, remember me when you do this. Make this a memorial that you do every year. You guys are in Exodus chapter 12. I want you to find verse number 18. Verse, I'm sorry, verse number 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Look, again, it's the symbology we see, what, what exactly what was said in 1 Corinthians 11, right? Get the sin out of your life. Examine yourself. Don't eat it unworthily. Judge yourself so you're not judged of God and then cut off. And here he says, hey, you want to keep the leaven and disobey God? Well, then you'll be cut off from the congregation. Well, that's not good. You want God's blessing in your life. Look at verse 20, the next verse. He says, ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations. Ye shall eat unleavened bread. Go to Luke chapter 22. I'll show you how Jesus addresses this same issue about our responsibility to purge ourselves. Hey, everyone is welcome to come in and take the Lord's Supper, to come in and take communion, but yet everyone is warned. Everyone is warned if you take it unworthily. Listen, if you're not saved, just don't take it. If you're in sin that you refuse to get right, and listen, we're all sinners. We're all unrighteous. We all make mistakes. But if you're not even willing in your heart to say, okay, God, I, I'm struggling with this. I need your help with this. I'm confessing it to you. Please forgive me of it. Help me to get past this sin. Then, you, then be careful. Be warned because you shouldn't be participating as well. And, you know, when we do communion, it's something that uh, the family head of the house should decide. Don't come ask me, hey, do you think this kid should take it or this kid? Dad, you decide. If that child is saved and they understand how, what the importance and the significance of it is, then, then that's up to you. So, you know, the fathers will serve the children. I, I will give it to the fathers and the fathers can take what they want and they will serve their children. I'm not going to make the judgment call on your children. You know them. You answer for their souls. So Luke chapter 22, let's look at how Jesus deals with this issue of those who are unworthy. Luke 22, look at verse 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. <laughs> Those are strong words. He's saying, woe unto you. So he knew that Judas wasn't saved and that he was working for the devil. And he said, woe unto that man. Right? If you're unworthy, be careful. There's a judgment. Judge yourself because you don't want to be condemned of God. You don't want God to come down from you. You don't want to be cut off from the congregation. He says, Woe unto that man by whom he was betrayed. Verse 23. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Now, 
the, so we're asking three questions, five questions today. Who, what, when, where, and how? And so here we see under who that everybody was welcome. Jesus didn't say this before communion. He said it after, right? He, and you can look in every gospel and you see that Judas was there. In every account of the Lord's Supper, Judas was there and the Bible tells us that Jesus knew that he had a devil from the beginning. So who, what, when, where, and how? The next question is what? What is communion? What is the Lord's Supper? Right? Well, it's unleavened bread that's physically broken. There's the technical. It's unfermented wine. It's uncorrupted juice. And we are commanded to keep it. It is a command for all believers. Look at verse number 15 in this chapter. Luke 22, verse number 15. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Right? There's him commanding it. Right? There's him you know, confirming. And of course, Paul said the same thing. Hey, I'm giving to you what I was given from Christ. So here Christ is saying, I have a desire to eat this with you. It's important. Verse 16, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now here he's talking about a future reference in the kingdom of the Lord, you know, the, the, the millennial reign, when Christ comes back to live with us and we reign with him. Verse 17, And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst, among yourselves. Now, we don't share a cup around here, okay? I'm sorry. The Catholics can share a cup and they wipe it off every time. Sorry, bro, I'm not drinking after you, okay? Here Jesus said, Take this and divide it. All right, so I'm going to have a pitcher of fruit juice, and I'm going to pour it into individual cups. We will divide the juice as Jesus commands here. Verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So Jesus is saying, I'm not drinking, anything, I'm not drinking with you guys again until the kingdom of God. Now notice here, and, you know, the Bible uses the word wine, and this will often confuse people. One time, the King James Bible uses the word juice, right, in the same sentence that wine is already used, and it's the same word if you go back to the original. So wine means juice. The question is, is it fermented juice or unfermented juice? Is it alcoholic juice or, or non-alcoholic juice? And you have to look at the context for each reference to understand whether we're dealing with alcohol or just plain old juice, right? Like we would call grape juice today. Notice what Jesus calls this though. He calls it, verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. Well, guess what? That's juice. That's not fermented. That's coming right off the vine. He said, hey, we took the grape and we squeezed it. And there you go. There's no fermentation. It's not corrupted. It hasn't sat there and stewed for months upon end. He's saying, in the kingdom, I will drink the fruit of the vine with you. So he will drink juice with us. So it's not alcoholic. It is not fermented. Guess what the Catholics do? They get drunk off of it. They buy palletfuls of wine because they sit around and, and they drink when they want. And of course, they have to have wine for the service. So of course they have wine with their meals and wine when they want. And you know, a bunch of perverts, they live together and say, well, we're not married to anybody. We're married to the church. And that's why they're full of perversion. Right? They perverted everything that God told us to do. And you know, so we have to take a stand against Catholicism. And you know, Catholics are the easiest to get saved because most of the people that attend a Catholic church, they have no idea what the Catholic church believes or teaches. They keep them in the dark. That's why they speak in Latin and they use symbology because they don't want the average person to understand. Well, guess what? God wants everybody to know the truth. And we will go out preaching the gospel. And I love Catholics because they're easier to get saved than you know, some of these hardcore Protestant Presbyterians. Look at verse number 19. He says, And he took the bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Again, he commands again. Here, do it in remembrance. I want you to remember that I'm about to give my body. This is my body which is given for you. But notice he breaks the bread. 
Now, there are other places in the Bible that talks about breaking bread where they are clearly not having the Lord's Supper. So that's just a phrase. Hey, back then you got a loaf of bread and if you wanted a piece, it didn't come machined from the store, perfectly sliced. Right? You had to break off a piece. And so that's what, hey, they started with some bread. They broke it, especially here being unleavened. It's going to be a little more crispy, more like a cracker or a wafer. So we will physically break bread. And it won't be wafers, it will be something that we make. And you know, this is not what the Catholics call transubstantiation. This is not the Eucharist. They literally teach that that bread literally turns into the literal flesh of Jesus when you eat it. Now this is strange. You know, the Orthodox and the Catholics are different. I think one says when you pray over it, when the, the priest blesses it, it becomes. And the other says, no, it's when you consume it. Look, that's not what the Bible's talking about. That's not even what it means. It's not, you know, it's not turning into flesh at all. That was a representation, representation of faith. Look at verse 20. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The New Testament, the New Covenant. How are we saved by the new covenant? What does that mean? That Christ has fulfilled the old covenant. We have a better testament, it calls it. And what is that? That Christ has come, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Well, he came, he lived, he was perfect, he died, he rose again. And we remember that by what he says here, this is the new testament in my blood. He's saying, I'm going to lay my life down and we're creating a new covenant moving forward. You know, in John chapter 6, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. So Jesus calls himself the bread. He says, My body is the bread. And you need to consume this. You need to get this. You need to believe on me to get everlasting life. So Jesus likens eating a piece of bread to believing on him for everlasting life. And you know that passage, they get angry with him, of course, as they often did. And he goes on, he says, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. He says, I am like that manna. That manna was simply a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life that came down. He is that bread that once you eat it, you won't have to eat any more bread to continue your life. And of course, they're trying to think in the flesh. Wait, you're saying I got to cut up your flesh? You're saying I need to consume your physical body? No, he's speaking spiritual things to them. He's saying you need to get a hold of this. You need to believe it. And then you're saved. Then you have eternal life. Once you eat that bread, you don't have to eat it again. Well, guess what, Catholics? What do they do? This is the lamb every week. This is the lamb that forgives sins. We're going to eat that lamb again. We're going to sacrifice that lamb again. We're going to kill Jesus again. Hey, he was slain from the foundation of the world. He was slain one time. He offered sacrifice one time. He fulfilled that covenant, and there's no need for the priest, for the, the sacrifice, for the meats, the drinks, you know, the bread, any of that anymore, because he has fulfilled those things. And yet he says, hey, this is my cup. Do it in remembrance of me. It represents my blood. This is bread. Hey, break it in remembrance of me. I want you to remember that I have fulfilled the old covenant and you don't have to keep all those feasts, but in the picture of unleavened bread, remember this moving forward. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Find verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Again, a commandment. Verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now go to Exodus chapter 13. So how long do we do it? Till he come. How long should we break bread and take the cup and do the Lord's Supper? Until he comes. Until the rapture. Until you die. In other words, as long as you're a New Testament believer, you need to continue doing this. And it is something we do every year. That's the next thing. We're looking at the who, the what, the when, 
the where and the how. So we're looking at the when next, and we do it every year, right before Easter, it's a yearly provision. It's something we do one, once a year. It's that first month of the year that we saw in the calendar. We read that last week in Exodus, and you know, the Bible calls it Easter in Acts chapter 12, you know, the days of unleavened bread. And in Exodus 12, it said that, you know, uh, this is the beginning of months. And, you know, he, he tells, you know, at the 10th day, you bring the lamb in. On the 14th day, you kill the lamb. And that's when you begin the feast of unleavened bread, right? And you do it for seven days. And that was the first month, sort of that, that new year restart. So in Exodus 13, where you're at, find verse number four. Verse number four, he says, This day came ye out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. So when do we keep it? Well, he tells us what month to keep it here. Uh, jump ahead to verse number 10. Thou shalt therefore... Keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. So it's a yearly thing. We don't do it every three or four months. And you could if you want, I think. But I believe, according to what the Bible shown, shown, it's a, one a year, once a year thing. And there is provision when you miss that. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In Numbers chapter 9, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians 11. In Numbers 9, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. Well, what's he saying? He's saying, look, if you show up and we're doing the Lord's Supper, and you have not had a chance to examine yourself, he's saying, whoa, you shouldn't do this. If you've touched it back then, he said, hey, if you touch a dead body or something like that, you know, you, you uh, did something that you should not, then you do not keep that covenant. He says in the next verse, the 14th day of the second month at even shall they keep it and eat with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So if there is somebody that says, listen, for whatever reason, I'm not able to keep this, but I understand the Lord has commanded us to keep it. We, we will do it again a month later. There is provision to do it for somebody that misses it. So there was the provision really to do it twice in a year, but really it was a one time of a year thing. The idea was at the beginning of the year, you just kind of hit the reset button. Now you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right? You guys get back there. So we're looking at the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. So we're going to look at the where, and this one's very important. The where is simple. It's at church. It's not at home. It's something that's done as a whole congregation. And there, there is heresies about this. He warned us about that. Look at verse number 18. First of all, when you are come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, on this verse here, there are others that point to this and say, see, we're not supposed to do it together. We don't come together as a church. And this is the verse that they will try to use to justify their stance. But what this verse does not say is don't do the, con the communion as a church. What it, it is not actually plainly stating what they claim that it says. Uh, what it's talking about is when you have a potluck, don't call that the Lord's Supper. And when you do have a potluck, you should share with each other. You should take care of each other. Let's read it again. He says, when you are come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Right? The Lord's Supper is not an everyday thing. It was yearly. It was special. It was significant. It was a time of the year you took things very serious and solemn and you paid attention to what was going on. So if you're, if you're having a potluck, we were all at Brother Kyle's house earlier. Hey, well, hey, that, that was the Lord's Supper, wasn't it? We were all communing. No, it's not. That's what he's warning about here. And I know there are others that misuse this verse and say, see, we can't have it in the church. Well, that's not what the verse says. He's warning you about ordinance in the church, how we should keep order. Look what he says in 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. He's saying, you guys get together for a potluck, 
and you say, this potluck is really communion. And we're going to get together every week and have communion. And we're going to do it on our own terms. And I brought steak and you got hot dogs and I'm eating mine first and I could care less if you're hungry. Right? He used those, those phrases at the end there. And he's talking about one is starving and one is full. You know? And it ought not to be that way. We ought to share. You know, we have potlucks every week in our church and we will never call it communion. We will never say this is keeping the Lord's Supper, you know, because guess what? Sometimes there are people that leave the, leave the sanctuary right away and they make a beeline for the fellowship hall. They get over there and man, they're in the crock pot right away. They're just loading it up, right? And that's okay. That's all right. But you know what? Don't call that the Lord's Supper and don't be so rude to say, well, I got my food and I could care less about everybody else. Forget them, I got mine. And that was the problem with the Corinthians, and that's what he's warning against here. Look at verse 22. He says, What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You know, because you think about what he's saying here. Shaming somebody that has not. Now, what is communion? It's a small piece of unleavened bread that's broken. It's a small amount of fruit juice. Almost all of us could afford that. Right? But here he's saying, hey, if we're having a potluck and you make food and you set it in there and somebody else eats your food, don't be rude to them. Don't shame them. But the flip side of that coin, what he's saying here is, don't go in there and eat your food in front of them. Oh, yeah, we, boy, we brought steak today. What do you have? Nothing? Huh. <laughs> Tough to be you, huh? Right? You, it shouldn't be that way. We should be loving toward one another. We should help each other. And that sort of, that's what was happening, and they were calling it communion. Well, this is the Lord's Supper, and I brought steak. Oh, he brought lamb. You brought nothing? Well, I guess you're not having communion today, are you? Think about how puffed up and how pride. I mean, this church in Corinth, they had a lot of problems. They, had, they were in the flesh. They didn't know all these things. They, these things had to be set in order and corrected. Look at, look at 22. He says, what, have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not. What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He said, look, food time is not the Lord's table. Potluck time is not the Lord's supper. And then he, so immediately he reminds them what the Lord's supper is. Verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So there was significance. There was a memorial. I want you to turn back to chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. So again, the potluck is not the Lord's Supper. And he's warning them about that. You're eating and you're, you're full and the other guy is starving and you're calling it the Lord's Supper to where then that guy doesn't even get to participate. It's not right. We should not do that in church. And hey, thank God we have the facility and the opportunity to fellowship around food here. But let's never be rude about it. Let's never be rude to, to a stranger. You ought to, you ought to go hungry and feed your brother if it comes down to it. You ought to feed a stranger, a visitor, and if they walk in there and take your food, and that was you had been looking forward to it, and you hadn't eaten breakfast, you know what your attitude ought to be? Well, praise the Lord, I could be a blessing to them. Instead of puffed up over what you had, and shame them for not having. Potluck is not the Lord's Supper. You're in Exodus chapter 12. Look at verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Right? So when he said, this do in remembrance of me, he said in 1 Corinthians 11. That's what we see in Luke chapter 22. We also see it in Mark chapter 14. We see it in Matthew chapter, what is it, 26. We see it in John chapter 13 that Jesus is reminding them, I have a desire to eat this. I want you to remember me. This do in remembrance of me. Why? It goes all the way back to when he delivered them. Right? What do he say there? Do it for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord throughout your generations, right? Until the, until the Lord returns. And ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Look at verse 17. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance 
forever. Hey, he set it in order. It's something that we keep. Jump ahead to verse 33. 33. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. What's he saying? Right? The Egyptians are coming after them. They're getting out of there in haste. They're hurrying. So they had kept the Passover lamb. Hey, Christ was our Passover. But yet he says, keep the feast. Right? In sincerity and truth, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Right? That's what we're memorizing as a church right now. Why? So we remember, hey, we keep the feast in sincerity. Christ was the Passover. Now we're going to get the leaven out of our life. Jump ahead to 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. About 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. 600,000 men. Not counting the children. Think about it. Now, if we, if we did an average in here and we just counted the men, that might be about half of our population. Right? There's a lot of children in here, but there are also single guys and smaller families, right? So 600,000 men, I believe, would equate to well over a million people. So here's the congregation making haste. They're leaving in a hurry. They've already kept the Passover at home by their family, one lamb per family, right? Salvation is an individual thing right? You got saved on your own belief. You got saved by what you believe and receive in your own heart. I can't get saved for you just because you go to this church doesn't make you saved. But now as a church, because we are all saved, we profess the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to follow this picture here where the entire congregation is out together. Over a million people here. He says, verse 38, and a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herds, even much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Go back to 1 Corinthians 11. So even in the Old Testament, the picture was the congregation kept the feast of unleavened bread. And yet the individuals, the families kept the Passover. And so there are people today that would point and say, well, I think we should just do the Lord's Supper at home in our own time, and we don't need to worry about examining ourselves. We can do it whenever we want. We can get around to it. Well, the problem with that is it just doesn't happen, right? Churches that don't keep the ordinance, guess what? The people aren't doing it. They're not keeping it at home. So that's why as a church, we keep it as a reminder. We're obeying that commandment. So once a year, somebody will remind you, hey, guess what? That those thoughts you're having, that sin you're dealing with, you need to get serious about it. You need to trust the Lord that He can help you overcome it and give it to the Lord. And confess it to the Lord. Try to forsake your sin. Follow the Lord. Get closer to Him in your life. And we're going to do it as a congregation. It doesn't mean we confess our sins together. Hey, we're just going to keep the solemn feast and remember what the Lord has forgiven us of. You're in 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 33. Wherefore, my brother... My brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Tarry means take your time, be slow, be patient. In, in application, it's saying help one another. Be giving to one another. You know, we had a family last year that came to the church, and they were hungry. And, you know, the, in that other building, all the crockpots were lined up in the back. That family would show up late occasionally, and they showed up late. And everybody had brought food that day. And they don't know the operation. They're not, they're not close members, but they were people that were visiting and growing and learning. They were saved. And you know what they did? As soon as church was over, they went over to those crock pots. Each crock pot was an individual family's food for the day. And they helped themselves to whatever they wanted. Hey, praise the Lord, we were able to feed them. Right? Some people got real offended. Other families just said, eh, it's okay. We'll get pizza. And that's what we did as a church. I, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll get pizza. And we'll feed everybody. Because you know what? They were hungry. Can you imagine shaming them? Everybody brought food today. Oh, what? that's my food. You give that back. Put that down. My wife cooked that for me. We're not allowed to eat that. We all come together. We should tarry one for another. You know, and that's what was happening here in 1 Corinthians is they were being rude to each other. They weren't willing to share. You know, and in the flesh, we love food. Right? Hey, we're commanded to fast. That's an important thing. You know, when's the last time you fasted? When's the last time you were able to go without food? 
All the more to give somebody else some food. You know, and you think about that, you think about that operation there, that that family was hungry, and it was a blessing that I can say of our church, we fed them. And there were some people that got offended. That was my food. I cooked this special dish. Well, look, I'm going to buy you pizza or whatever. What would we, we get? Firehouse subs, whatever it was. The church paid for it, and we made sure everybody ate that day. But you know what? Hey, if, if they ate some of your food, some of y'all that were there, praise the Lord, they, you fed them. You fed them. Don't have a hard heart about that. And if the same thing happens again, if we have visitors in here and they go into our fellowship hall and they just take whatever they want, go ahead and send them home with some seconds. <laughs> right? Hey, why don't you take some home for somebody else? Lord be with you. Lord bless you. Don't shame them because they don't have food. Look at verse 34. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home that he come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. If the food becomes such a problem for you in the congregation, then why don't you just eat at home so you're not hungry or in the flesh here in church and then being condemned of God, being judged of God because you're not tearing one for another. We need to be patient for each other. We need to love each other. And that's what it's talking about as, as far as the eating at home. And that's the application of it here. And I know that people misuse that. We've got one last question. It's how. How is communion kept? And it's a solemn feast, right? It's, it means serious. It's a serious time of the year. It's orderly. Things have an order, right? It's after examining yourself. Remember in Exodus when he said that all the congregation should keep it, right? No uncircumcised person. You shouldn't be unsaved. Look at verse 27 in this chapter. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So who is unworthy? Well, that's the saved, not examining themselves. Hey, that's also the unsaved, that they don't care about the body of Christ. They don't care what Christ did for them. They're just going to, I want everybody to see that I'm, I'm one of them, right? Be careful. Look what he says in verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Go to Numbers chapter 9 and we'll be done here. Numbers chapter 9. So listen, it's that time of year. Take it seriously. Be willing to purge yourself. Be willing to ask the Lord, Lord, show me my secret faults. Show me the sins that I'm overlooking. Show me the things that I need to fix so I can be used of you more. It's not something you need to avoid. It's not something you should skip. You need to obey God's commandment to do it. And you need to remember it. You need to keep it with us and do it for God's glory. Don't do it to be seen of men. Do it so that you understand that God said, hey, look, I died for all your sins. Once a year, I want you to come together and remember what I've forgiven you of. You know, last year we had an Andersonite that refused to obey it. And he couldn't give me any scripture. Well, you know, I just think I should do it at home. And I said, well, why? Where in the Bible can you show me where it says that? Because look, Christ was our Passover. That was at home. What scripture do you use? Well, I don't have any scripture. I just feel that we should do it at home. Listen, that, that Andersonite response of, I'm just going to follow what the man said. Hey, I follow Paul as long as he follows Christ. Right? You know what I'm saying? Hey, you can follow Anderson, but when he stops following Christ, stop following him. Right. I don't care if he's right on salvation. If he's wrong on communion, don't follow him in that because you won't be blessed. Amen. God does this so that we will be blessed, especially as a congregation. But if you want to be blessed as an individual, you should not skip it. You should not avoid it. You should not rebel against what the Bible says. Well, I don't understand it. I just know that who I follow doesn't do this, so I'm following him. Well, you're following the wrong person. You're, you're, you're skipping it for the wrong reason. Right? The Bible gave a time and a reason to skip it. We're going to look at that right now. Numbers chapter 9, verse number 10. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you, of your posterity, shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. The fourteenth day of the second month at even shall he keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Right? How are we going to do it? We're going to put bitter herbs in the unleavened bread. Now here, if you miss it, I will make provision for you a month later. 
I will help you out. A month later, we will take care of it. We will make sure that you have that opportunity, right? So that is the purpose, you know, that, hey, if you say, look, there's something I'm dealing with. I can't talk about it. Can I do it a month from now? No questions asked. Yes, I'll make provision. The Bible tells us to. Be, be merciful, be long-suffering as Christ was. But look what he says, continuing on. Look at verse 12. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any bone of it, according to all the ordinances of the Passover, they, sh they shall keep it. What he's saying is, back in Exodus 12, it said, hey, don't break any bones. Sound familiar? The Lord Jesus Christ. This is the memorial. We remember what he did for us. He died for us. But notice, first they roasted it, then they burnt what was left, right? Jesus died in hell for your sins. That was a picture of what Christ did. Look at verse 13. But the man that is clean and is not in a journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season. That man shall bear his sin. So if you're clean, if there's no reason you should miss it, and you decide to skip the Lord's table to avoid communion, he's saying you're going to bear your sin. That's a presumptuous sin. To him to know it do good and do it not, to him it is sin, right? The Bible says we should remember this once a year. We should take a time to get serious. And look, don't, don't say, well, I can't get perfect. Hey, amen, none of us can. But you need to talk to the Lord. You need to, you need to, you need to talk, you need to confess to him. You need to deal with what you're dealing with and help the Lord you know, be able to use you by sacrificing your own desire, right? We should die daily to Christ. And here he's saying once a year, let's get real serious about this. Let's take a time. Don't skip it. Don't avoid it. If you're clean, you don't have a reason why you need to, to wait a month. Don't wait a month. Just do it. The who? Every Christian. Not the unworthy. The what? Unleavened bread, broken, unfermented wine, not alcoholic. The when? Right before Easter, right? We make provision. We're giving you warning in advance, right? So we will do it where? At church, not at home. We do it at church as a congregation. How? We do it as a solemn feast. We do it orderly. We do it after examining ourselves. So what's communion for? To give God the glory in your life. It's your personal opportunity this time of year just to say, Lord, let me lay everything else aside and focus on you. And listen, there are a lot of you that, are, that have, hey man, I'm making great spiritual growth personally and my family's moving forward and, and I really even feel the same way in a lot of things. And yet there are things that we all need to just, okay Lord, what else? What else do you want me to do? I, I'll do it. I want to be used of you more and more and more. And that's the purpose of communion. So let's have a good heart about it. Let's obey the Lord in this commandment. Let's not avoid it. Let's not try to, you know, take some strange Catholic perspective of things, or let's not, you know, take some strange Andersonite view of things, right? Which, when, when Anderson, I mean, when he, when he brags about being the only person in the world that sees it this way, guess what? That's wrong. That's wrong. That's a little weird, okay? When you start, I'm the only one that sees it this way. I came up with this doctrine. Okay, we call that strange doctrine. There must be heresies among us to show what is approved. There is a time and a purpose. And listen, because of what the Catholics do, I can understand why people have a knee-jerk reaction away from Catholicism. Well, I don't want to do what they're doing. Hey, amen. What they're doing is heretical. It's heresy. They're trying to sacrifice God over and over and over as if His one sacrifice was insufficient. So again, don't overcorrect and end up in the ditch. If you go to too far to the left or the right, you're in the ditch. And communion is one of those things that's just like that, right? Don't avoid it. Don't do it at home. Don't follow what the Catholics do. Let's do what God said. And it's very simple. It's very easy. But it's that time of the year for you to examine yourself and get right with God. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the truths that can be found in the Bible. Lord, thank you for making the heresies exposed so that we know what's approved. Lord, we love you and we, we just thank you for this church. Lord, I, I love every minute that we have here, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to uh, help us to grow spiritually, individually, and in our families. Lord, I pray you bless our time together and our fellowship, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, 
this man shall be blessed in his deed.